Hello and welcome to the emerging role of AI in detecting fisheries crime webinar brought to you by the Earth Journalism Network, which is a project of Internews. I am Mona Samari, the moderator of this panel. I'm also an ocean journalism media trainer and campaigner and the co-founder of the West Africa Fisheries Journalism Project. I'm currently based in Tunisia. I'm joined today by a fantastic panel. From Canada, I have Mr. Peter Stout, Dean of the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities at Ontario Tech University. Peter has written and co-written over 10 books and over 50 peer-reviewed articles, and is one of the world's leading experts on transnational eco-crime. Also in Canada, we have Bia Belabib, who is the Principal Investigator of Fisheries at EcoTrust Canada. She's also the founder of Spyglass and an open access data platform and AI entrepreneur. From London, I am joined by Peter Horn, who is the project director of the Ending the Legal Fishing Campaign at the Few Charitable Trusts. Before joining Q, Peter served more than 30 years in the British Navy, and he also reached the commander rank and was accorded the most excellent order of the British Empire. And last but not least, also in London, we have Karen McVeigh, brilliant journalist, global development correspondent at the Guardian newspaper, who's been producing some landmark investigations on illegal activities taking place at sea. So quite the panel. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time today and also thank the audience for joining. One of the key questions we will be looking to tackle through the presentations and during our questions and answers session with our online participants is whether the development of AI, and by AI we mean machine learning, algorithms, cheaper access to satellites, data collection is enough to solve the unprecedented overfishing crisis facing our oceans today. Before I hand over to our keynote speaker, Peter Stout, I would like to remind our online participants that they can post their questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom and that we aim to get your questions answered at the end of the presentation. So over to you, Peter, thank you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mona. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Am I being successful? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's uh, it's a great privilege to be here today and 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 to be with this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. Um, and Mona didn't introduce herself properly she's she's also a, she's a key player in the fight against um oceanic eco violence i think and so she deserves full credit for that and i've, I've enjoyed co-authoring something with her recently um i, I think as, as journalists i don't have to impart this on you but it, it always strikes me as unfortunate that people still aren't realizing the, the significant uh impact that the oceans have i mean without it there there, there are no humans and we have to keep stressing this, I think. So I never miss an opportunity <laughs> to reinforce this central message um, that oceans provide you know, so much of our, our, our uh, the ecosystem services upon which we are um, dependent and as well, of course, provide such great inspiration for our thinking, our culture, our history, everything else. Um, they also absorb uh, roughly a quarter of the carbon we emit on, on a yearly basis, which is a vital function, of course. Uh, on which we're still heavily dependent until we get that better in order. Um, and 10 to 15 percent of the world's population is employed in, in the wild capture seafood industry. Uh, it's the main source of protein for around 3 billion people, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization. A third of all fish stocks are overfished, however, and are probably no longer biologically sustainable. And that's a, that's a very harrowing statistic. Um, and also 90% of coral reefs could be gone by 2050. So just to set it up, um, we're still dependent on these things. Um, the uh, transnational oceanic eagle violence, fancy way of, of saying different forms of maritime crime, I'll get back to that. Um, and I've, I've listed several here. I think that not everyone, likes, not everyone likes this term, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. I get that. Um, but it is the one that's used by the UN at this point. Um, but we can discuss whether that should be shifted. It is a bit maybe alien to, to some the general public. So, you know, there, there could be just an easier way of saying fisheries crime or what have you. Um, but it involves a wide array of criminal activity, including illegal foreign fishing festivals and exclusive economic zones, 
Um, the use of flags of convenience, which can be legal and illegal, it's, that's a complicated one. Um, there's no doubt this is a massive industry uh, in terms of you know, the extent uh, to which this occurs on a daily basis. And this, this one study that did come up uh, was very interesting where albatrosses were used, uh, radar sensors were strapped to them, um, and they were allowed to just fly over the Indian Ocean as they do anyways uh, for six months one year. Uh, it indicated that something like 25% of vessels had their automatic identification systems turned off within EEZs and close to 40% turned them off in international waters. Now that's not always a sign that they're illegally fishing, but it's often a very good indication as we know. Um, so the problem is massive. Um, that's, that's just uh, you know, the Indian Ocean. Um, it, it carries through and others. Um, and another element that, uh, and I stressed this in a, in a recent uh, book that Mona helped uh, author parts of actually a chapter on um, illegal fisheries, the, uh, are the reduction industries, right? So most people don't know this either, but the public would be surprised to learn this probably, but roughly one out of every fish caught in the, from the oceans in the world doesn't go to human cons consumption at all. It goes to consumption by agriculture, uh, livestock, it goes to consumption by other fish, which are being raised in aquaculture. Aquaculture is often touted as the solution to our problems of overfishing the oceans. And yet we're catching wild, we're catching wild fish um, basically and uh, uh, reducing them to fish meal, which we're using to feed uh, those um, uh, agri or aquacultured fish. So the reason I mention this isn't just because that in itself is a bit of a travesty in my view that a lot of fish are going to, you know, people's gardens and so on um, to nurture soil, but it's also, uh, there are connections between that and illegal fisheries. And one of the ways they're connected to is, is this aspect of sea slavery, which is in the, probably in the 10,000s yearly uh, in terms of how many people are captured into this forced labor trade. And I think we'll have more on that later. There are other forms of maritime crime. I don't, we, we shouldn't focus only on fishing because AI and, and advanced technology gives us opportunities to uh, identify the occurrence and track. And in many cases, I think will, it will give us the ability to deter many of these other crimes too, which I list here. Some of which like acoustic pollution or things, you know, we wouldn't even think about 40 years ago, 30 years ago, um, but we know that uh, this, this is a serious issue. Um, one of the major issues that are emerging right now is illegal sand mining um, and transport. And that's another thing that the public might not be too aware of. Um, so, sorry. Um, yeah, so I won't go into detail here. I think some of these will come up later. We shouldn't confuse piracy with, uh, some, because piracy is often the sexiest. It gets the most attention when it happens um, off of Somalia and so on. Um, but it's a vessel hijacking now that's a serious problem in, in many areas. Uh, and, and one of the number one um, attractions there is, the, is the, the influx of crude palm oil uh, as a uh, internationally traded um, commodity. Um, so many wildlife are affected by not just the illegal fish trade, but by all these activities. I wanna stress that it's not just about fish, it's about all these other wonderful species. And then pay particular attention to the bottom one phytoplankton and zooplankton, which are threatened by plastic pollution and, and other aspects of especially pollution. Um, this is the base of the food web and the base of the carbon cycle uh, in terms of the ocean's contribution I mentioned previously. There are so many different high-tech uh, uh, mechanisms that are emerging now that can be used. AI, I think, links them all. That's the proper way to think of AI in my view. Um, and I know that we'll have uh, uh, speakers after me far more uh, knowledgeable about this, so I'm not going to get into it in detail. Um, but these, these are just some of the examples that, you know, quick literature search will, will bring up. And they're all very important, of course, and, and I think they're all part of this, this fight against organized, especially um, fisheries crime in particular. Um, many cases, what we're talking about with fisheries crime are, you know, it's, it might just be a poacher acting on his or her own and, and that sort of thing. The organized crime, though, is much tougher to fight, of course, um, because it involves a very complex supply chain where, where material is being transferred. Um, at the bottom, again, here on this list is this, I think, the, the most high-powered concept of, of uh, AI, and this is this creation of an ocean of things. Uh, you'll, you'll have heard the term network of things, or, or sorry, internet of things. 
Um, so we're talking now actively about how, you know, all this information can be linked. We're talking about this at the UN and, and other, and a lot of it has to do with fishing, but also climate surveillance and overcoming the human limitations, as I mentioned here. Um, physical observers are expensive. They're, they're, they can be corrupted. They're, they're very hard to get in, in remote areas. And they're often considered very intrusive when it comes to fishing operations. Um, can AI supplant that or, or supersede that is one of the questions we have to deal with. But we're, when we're talking about thousands and thousands of hours of video footage, you know, it, um, it's an affordability issue too. You just can't afford to go through that as an individual um, or, or hiring individuals to go through that. So can AI help um, in terms of recognition and, and when it comes to um, surveillance? Um, and the broader question, I think, is, yeah, can they supplant? Uh, right now, we rely on citizen science for a lot of things. I do a lot of work in invasive um, alien species. And, and that's one of the things that we rely on very heavily, of course, are you know, citizens reporting data, citizens reporting data. It's all about data. Um, but there are a lot of challenges that it comes to, that AI will rise. And, and I think we'll see some of this uh, explicated later uh, today. Um, so big data challenges. This is, this is identified in Global Environmental Outlook 6, which is a report I recently co-authored for the United Nations Environmental Program. Um, and there were three that we really focused in on, accessibility, um, quality, um, reliability of the data, for example. And sparsity is very important um, because we're still dealing with tremendous gaps, especially when it comes to our knowledge of oceans. You know, we better map the moon and Mars than we have our ocean floors. So. Um, Cognitive Ocean Network, this is an article that came out recently, but again, going back to this, this idea of establishing you know, um, an ocean of things or what have you, uh, we can call it different things, but, but some of the challenges here that I hope will come up today, some of our panelists might address. Um, we need self-maintenance. So this is, again, part of this is machine learning. Part of it is, yeah, um, tech being able to take care of itself. Can't go out and fix things every time they break down. Energy efficiency is very important. Communications, um, fog and edge computing, right? Which has to do with the distribution of data and so forth. Um, and I know I, I've, I'm running out of time, so, but uh, I just wanted to force that, that there are ethical questions related to this. Um, Interpol recently had a, a conference on robotics for law enforcement. They've actually set up a research center on this. They stress fairness, accountability, transparency, transparency and explainability is the most important factors. And so I'll conclude with this. Um, I, I think artificial intelligence and advanced tech in general has great promise. There's no doubt about that. And this is gonna be one of the big stories I think of the next five years. And I hope you can all cover it in detail, it's wonderful. Um, but it won't eliminate certain things that are at heart political, you know, like distrust issues between fishers and governments, corporate rivalries, security dilemmas of governments. The governments are not going to share information openly to the extent that we might like them to, but we, and yet we need them to to really fight transnational crime. Um, it won't eliminate the main drivers, you know, uh, greed and poverty and ignorance and some combination of the three. Um, and, and then I stress this bottom. Um, you know, it, it won't eliminate the need for significant resourcing to create a sustainable blue economy, um, climate, climate adaptation, uh, climate and plastic protein and justice, all these issues are intertwined with this. And in fact, AI could exacerbate inequalities if we're not aware of that. So we need to move forward uh, with that firmly in mind. Thank you very much, Maura. Are we still there, Mona? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I have some slight um, connection issues. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dia Bellabib, who is the principal investigator at Equa Trust Canada and is also an emerging AI entrepreneur in the not-for-profit sector. So over to you, Dia. Thank you very much, Mona. I'm just turning my sharing my screen. You should be able to see it now. And good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm talking about I'm talking from Vancouver. It's five in the morning. Hopefully, no children are going to storm in. Um, so I'm going to talk about illegal fishing. I am not using the term IUU at all. I'm not a very big fan of it. And we're going to cover the basics first and the reason why. 
Um, so the definition of illegal fishing is something that has really been puzzling a lot of researchers recently. Um, how we can um, how we can actually use it and what does it really include? Uh, so illegal fishing literally includes everything that has to do with the operation of fishing when something is, is wrong, when something is done illegally. So it's a violation of laws and regulation use regulations using your fishing vessels. It, it's literally and usually not criminal. So fishing without a license or a permit or an authorization, fishing beyond quota, for example, fishing for the wrong species using an illegal gear, fishing in prohibited areas like areas that are reserved for the small scale sector and um, areas, for example, MPAs or marine protected areas. And it also includes other types that are not necessarily directly linked to the fishing activity itself, but it's meant to actually hide the illegal activity, like using a forge license or uh, hiding the vessel identity, et cetera. Now and today at present, it has actually uh, extended a bit to include other types of actual crimes, entities like companies and people as well. So. Um, the the uh, basic um, the basic behind this is that the basics behind this is that drugs might be traded on board fishing vessels. So what do we call that? So we tend to really include this in the term of illegal fishing, human rights and labor abuse. I just um, talked about uh, by Peter and financial crimes as well, like corruption, robbery. These these types of financial crimes are usually meant to be a diversion strategy for illegal fishing activities, but also to hide the profits from any activities that are connected or connected to illegal fishing itself. In terms of trends, and I like numbers, and I like to show them, uh, we, I would say we don't give much importance to illegal fishing in the general media or the general public. Um, however, we should, because we eat fish more than we drink coffee. Fish is the most trended food commodity in the world. It's even before coffee. So we all drink our coffee, most of us at least in the morning. We don't necessarily think about fish, but we actually eat fish more than we drink coffee. However, one in five fish is caught illegally in the world. And this is, to me, it's an underestimation. And I'm going to say when I, I cover the trend um, a little bit more later, uh, in some areas of the world, 90% of all fishing happens in areas that are protected for for coastal communities. It means that it takes away alternative, it takes away options of livelihood for them and it reduces their resilience and their food security. In other types of crimes, drug trafficking, for example, using the fishing sector generates $80 billion a year to drug traffickers uh, in drug trade alone. And the fishing sector has been recognized as one of the most emerging uh, ways through which drugs are being traded. And in some areas, again, in Southeast Asia, for example, and Peter has touched on that a bit, we've estimated that nearly 40% of all labor is actually tra um, trafficked or in conditions of forced labor. And this is massive. When we talk now about hotspots, we often think about West Africa or East Africa. However, we don't really necessarily point to Japan, which is an actual hotspot of illegal fishing. Canada, for example, Western Canada particularly, is a hotspot for illegal fishing as well. And then we go to Southeast Asia for human trafficking and, and forced labor and Somalia for more conflict related issues and drug trafficking as well. So it's really a matter of here of coverage. The more coverage you have, uh, you know, when, when you're like a reporter or a journalist, the more you would think that that area is highly sensitive to this issue, but you have also the high monitoring. Like in Canada, for example, we do have higher monitoring their region such as West Africa. So there's a discrepancy there that we need to consider when we cover these topics. And many people have told me in the past, yeah, but it's declining because we're more aware and there are more solutions now. That is not actually the case. Illegal fishing and associated crimes have been increasing. And the numbers that you see in 2020 are actually an estimation based on a conservative uh, method. So it's really likely that it has increased and going to keep increase for a while, especially as it's now an emerging um, uh, form through which, for example, drugs are being traded. The resources now and the solutions that we have to address this, um, there are multiple ones. And as I like to brag, uh, I'm going to present Spyglass first. So um, 
I am an advocate for transparency and I'm an advocate for even more for information democracy because transparency on its own is not necessarily enough. You have to make sure that people have access to information uh, in an equitable manner. So uh, we have created Spyglass um, in 2019 to basically showcase the criminal record of fishing vessels and the seafood companies that are associated with them. It really comes to uh, challenge the IUU list of vessels, which only includes around 300 vessels. And it only showcases vessels for which there has been a negotiation, for example, by regional fisheries management organizations or, or the members of those uh, organizations or the vessel has been has done something wrong and has been reported by a country. It does not include the bulk of the other 6,400 vessels that are out there fishing illegally. And so to adjust for that, we have created Spyglass, which gives access publicly to all information linking to vessels that have been engaging in any type, fishing vessels that have been engaging in any type of offenses or criminality. Um, if we're talking about AI solutions now, I wanted to put this on a timeline. Um, in the past, in I would say five years ago, we have been uh, thinking more about VMS, like for the past 20 years actually, which is vessel monitoring systems. We have been talking about satellites as well, so AIS, and only a few platforms you could have access to that, or it was extremely expensive to get access to that. Most of the information was only available to some, like VMS, for example, it was only used by governments, uh, coastal states, to be able to monitor the vessels that have been registered to fish within their waters, for example. Then you have like the classic model of sending a boat out to be able to monitor other vessels. And one can argue there that the capacity diverges from one country to another. In the present time, as AI has emerged, um, we see more, uh, I would say, um, uh, more access to information. Global Fishing Watch, for example, uses an algorithm uh, where it links a point A and the point B, where point A and point B are actually AIS signals of fishing vessels, and it tells through that machine learning program whether the vessel has been fishing or basically not. So you're able to see the fishing tracks of vessels over time up to like three days ago. So it's not like necessarily real time, but it's near real time. You have Skylight that has been created by Vulcan and Ocean Mine, both use an algorithm that actually can understand the behavior and wind water, can understand the behavior of fishing vessels and can say whether the fishing vessel is high risk or not. Three years from now, I think these AI systems are going to be perfected to be able to profile vessels accordingly. And just like the way we profile, for example, psychopaths or child predators when you're talking about like uh, other types of criminality. And that's where I want to go to the future and what we're going to be able to see in terms of AI. The first thing that I'm really excited about, because I'm working on something like this myself, is the drones and how drones could use AI to detect, for example, drugs or, or a fish on board vessels or illegal fishing, etc. This types of drones, for example, so uh, Melanie Anderson recently, very recently, has basically placed uh, moth antennas, real moth antennas, onto a drone that can actually be, because moths are very sensitive to smells, and these drones can actually smell. Their use can be like, they can be tremendously uh, beneficial used, for example, to detecting bombs or drugs and things like that. So imagine in a world where you can actually integrate AI technology or effective and efficient AI technology, AI technology that is ethical and that decolonizes uh, efforts of surveillance around the world to these kinds of drones, whether big or small, it basically increases presence at sea, but it also makes it, um, uh, we're talking about maritime domain awareness more accessible to everybody. So for me, how I see the future, we're gonna see more profiling of fishing vessels so basically what the activity or when the activity of fishing vessel looks typically illegal. We're starting to do that right now. A paper has just been published uh, in December uh, 2020, although we all want to forget about that year, um, by Global Fishing Watch that is actually profiling the activities of vessels engaging in human rights and labor abuse. Um, I think that we're going to see more legal finish, some countries being able to sanction their vessels uh, and increase transparency in general. And finally, I would like to really say something important here. We should focus on community and getting together and not on competition as we build these kind of systems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh,
Peter Horn, uh, Project Director of the Ending Illegal Fishing Pain at Pew. Over to you. Thank you, Thank you Mona. And hopefully everybody can uh, see my slides and uh, hello. Slight divergence uh, from the two previous speakers because um, I did uh, want to include illegal, unreported and unregulated uh, fishing. And I, hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll make it uh, clear as I go through uh, the presentation why that is important. Um, I'll also say technology helping combat, combat IEU fishing um, because the thing is that as we, at, at, at the outset, I think that we need to recognize, or I recognize, that te technology is part of the answer. It's very important, but, uh, you know, it, it can't operate in a vacuum, and it, it isn't really a, it, it's a silver bullet. What we can do is use technology to get us to ask a better question. We can use technology to do some remote surveillance. We can use it to position ourselves. The, you know, what we can use technology for, we'll now uh, go, go into. I mean, we think about technology and um, one of the things I would say over the last 10 years is there's been a huge democratization of data. Uh, when I was back in the Royal Navy, the, we used exactly the same systems and sensors which are available today, but now they're available to NGOs, they're available to anybody. They used to just be available to developed uh, countries with developed uh, defense systems. And this huge access to, to data sets and to the improving technology on satellites, which all of a sudden gave them the capacity to start transmitting ship positions all over the, uh, all over the, the, the surface of the earth and share information has been you know, fantastic. However, the right hand side of the, uh, the slide there is, you know, we're drinking from a fire hose and all the way back in uh, 1934, I think it was T.S. Eliot who said, where is the knowledge that we're losing in information? And this is where technology comes back in because actually it helps us process that information. We've got a vast amount of information which is available to us, but we really are drinking from that fire hose. And so we've got more data sets, we've got more databases, we've got really quick access to that data and we've got better processing and we need to use it. And that's why it leads to machine learning and you see that I, I put machine learning rather than AI and the reason for that is I think that the you look at a definition of AI and it talks about thinking and working like humans and actually what we're doing here is we're doing analysis and so different humans will approach the problem in different ways and it's very very hard to program a system to go through all of the different all of the different things all of the different criteria the weather the you know various various uh, factors which mean that some somebody's actually doing something wrong or lets you identify however machine learning is incredibly powerful and as just pointed out there is a number of um systems which are out there which are doing fantastic job jobs about identification and tracking of fishing vessels it, it really helps us to then start building the vessel checks and making risk assessments. And that is right at the heart of things like the Port State Measures Agreement, where countries undertake to share information and check the provenance of the fish which is coming into their port. It should lead to transparency, but I think transparency is a double-edged sword here. And rather than think of a, a transparency as a universality, there's a sort of an internal transparency and an external transparency. And that internal transparency is between relevant authorities. And if you're not, if you don't have access to all of the data, and rather than admit that you don't have all of the registration details or authorization details of the, um, the vessels which are flying your flag, you choose not to sell it, uh, not to share it, that's a lack of transparency. There's the civil society transparency where we can use open systems to go in and look at uh, the performance of people, but they're two slightly different things. And we've got to encourage both transparency internal and transparency external. And we see this in a number of fora where say, you know, 
this week uh, we have the uh, UNFAO is running Kofi, and there's a great diversity in the capabilities of nations that are up there. And so a country like the US or like the UK, you can have a huge array of, uh, of people and teams working to provide a position. Other countries don't necessarily have that. And that inhibits transparency, it inhibits sharing. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that technology will allow us to do, will help us to get nations to share because by nations, by authorities sharing, that's going to be hugely important. Hopefully, technology will lead us towards compliance. Now, I'd like to talk about three different uh, elements of technology. And looking at this slide, I, I thought I'd sort of uh, revert to type and talk about what happens at sea. And on the left hand side is a, uh, an image that uh, was captured when we were doing some work with uh, Ocean Mind. And that is all of the AIS tracks around the globe on any given day. And you can see the shape of all the land masses around the, the world. And the thing here is this is technology at work. We've got about 370 million square kilometers of ocean. An IEU fishing vessel is around about 200 meters square. So trying to find that fishing vessel is like trying to find a needle in a haystack like trying to find a grain of sand in Central Park, but technology helps us narrow down where we're going to look. The next slide to the right shows um, something called synthetic aperture radar. And so this was having located where we thought fishing activity was occurring. We then went through a process where we tried to match the picture of synthetic aperture radar from a satellite taken down looking at an area to identify those vessels that the previous speakers have highlighted do not transmit on AIS. And so this is uh, an image that we took in a, um, in a closed area for tuna fishing. And at the left-hand side of the screen there, you can see a, uh, an AIS track and the little circle next to it, which is the SAR, the synthetic aperture radar detection, which we could correlate. But over in the center of this uh, area where nobody was meant to be fishing, was uh, a vessel and synthetic aperture radar said this is a vessel which is 80 meters. That means uh, it should be transmitting on AIS because it is over all the criteria for that. The reason why a vessel that size is not transmitting in the middle of a, uh, a closed fishing area is a matter for uh, conjecture. But it shows that there is an awful lot of activity out there which where vessels are not, uh, are not transmitting. The next slide would be the natural progression. So we've got the AIS, we've, proce we've processed the AIS, we've taken a synthetic aperture radar uh, image, and now we're saying, right, let's have a little look what's happening. And the bottom right is an electro-optical image taken from satellite. And that clearly shows two vessels tied up together with derricks over each other's uh, decks. So they're likely to be transshipping. However, those three slides do not give us positive identification. Those three slides would not, those three pictures before, would not allow you to question necessarily the individual master of a vessel or the company that owned it. The one at the bottom left there is the only one which actually provides unequivocally vessel identity. And that's actually a manned uh, surveillance craft which has gone out there and, uh, and, and investigated those uh, vessels. The reason why I show this slide is that the technology is there to do all of that, but actually sometimes the cost isn't worth it. We had to take about four electro-optical images to get that one that you've seen, because we couldn't actually tear it up that well, because looking at EO from the sky, it's like looking through uh, a soda straw. So it's quite interesting there. There are, some great initiatives ongoing where people are, uh, are using this. And I'd like to flag up the Sea Shepherd work, which many of you will be aware of, off the east and west coast of Africa, where they've worked closely with a synthetic aperture radar uh, company called MBA and provided some AIS support from Global Fishing Watch, synthetic aperture from uh, MBA, and they've actually embarked law enforcement detachments and gone and arrested vessels. That that works, but you need to use it 
uh, carefully. This is another initiative that we did. This is machine learning and some work that we did with uh, Global Fishing Watch. And as has been explained before, Global Fishing Watch analyzed track data to ascertain the likelihood of the activity that those vessels are doing. And in this particular one, we had both fishing vessels and refrigerated cargo vessels, often known as reefers. And we're looking to see how we can assess the degree of transshipment that is happening globally. Now, this is remote sensing. We hope that actually by doing this with the very uh, clever algorithms from uh, Global Fishing Watch, that we can actually understand the pattern of transshipment or the likely pattern of transshipment, because not everybody has to transmit AIS, but all refrigerated cargo vessels do. And so we can identify when a refrigerated cargo vessel has met up with a vessel, a fishing vessel, which is transmitting on AIS. And then we can also identify the same track behavior where the refrigerated cargo vessel doesn't appear to have met up with anybody who is transmitting on AIS. We see this as a massive step forward for transparency. It's hopefully going to help the RFMO, the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations, uh, who have the duty of compliance and monitoring fish stocks to actually check the data that they have. We found that they hadn't actually been checking uh, too often. What it will also do is identify areas for policy improvement and implementation. Because as we do this, we can highlight gaps in management measures. We can highlight ports, which perhaps may be of interest to uh, tighten controls. And hopefully overall, it will improve transparency because it makes this data accessible, not only to journalists like yourself or people like myself, but also the countries who can't afford full surveillance systems, this gives them a decent idea of what's happening in their waters. The final slide that I have is uh, a study which we did uh, using machine learning and analysis, uh, using data from 20, 2017, where we got all of the AIS tracks from all fishing vessels and refrigerated cargo vessels, and looked at those vessel movements over a full year. And out of that, we identified what were the top busiest states uh, for the vessels to go to, what the traffic levels were like. And we also combined that with what regulations that they had in place. And from that, by nature of how many fishing vessels were coming in, what flag states those fishing vessels were coming from, what regulations were in place, we were able to make an assessment of risk. We also could look at the ports and say, right, what were the busiest days? What were the busiest weeks? What were the um, likely nationalities of the vessels going there? And also, of course, you could look through the data and say, um, right, flag states, where are they Where are they visiting? Which, uh, which ports are they particularly targeting? This was a huge amount of data that was done excellently with machine learning. However, it took over two months of analytical work afterwards to clean the data enough for people to be able to access it. And this is right at the heart of the challenge here. I go back to the point that technology is a huge, you know, is, is moving all the time and we're getting better access to information. We're getting better uh, ideas of what is happening on the water. However, it still needs the inquiring mind to actually start asking the questions and investigating and ground truthing that which is being reserved, uh, observed remotely. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you very much, Peter, for that presentation. Um, we will, of course, get to questions at the end of all the, the presentations. We're encouraging all the participants to place your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom. We'll be getting to those at the end. With that, I would like to give the floor to Karen McVeigh to give a journalist perspective on some of the obstacles faced in covering these fishery stories. Karen has been producing some excellent reports of late and it's a great honor to have you on this panel. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, I work for the Guardian newspaper and website and uh, I have done for a number of years. When I got the job of covering the Guardian Seascape series, uh, which focuses on the health of the seas, pollution, overfishing, I was really delighted to be writing about something that I think is really important for biodiversity, for climate change, and 
for the health of the planet and for the livelihoods of local coastal communities. But I quickly, um, next slide please, I quickly realised the challenges of the job. Um, as we all know, overfishing happens out of sight. A lot of the, is very poorly regulated and it crisscrosses a number of many different jurisdictions. So that can make reporting very tricky um, and pinning down the culprits even trickier. Uh, so, so, so I, in my reporting, I look for sort of certain hooks that, that will basically hook people into a story or where I can find the best stories um, that are interesting about what's going on out in the ocean. Um, and those hooks are crime, which we've heard quite a lot about that already. Um, we also inequality where developing countries are, developed countries plunder developing countries for their resources, leading to inequality. Um, it's often not really known about, uh, but that's another really good hook. And one of the ways to hook in, to draw these out in a narrative is to look for the human drama. Um, next slide, please. Uh, last summer, we published a story, the story here about uh, four Indonesian fishermen who died after enduring terrible conditions aboard a Chinese tuna vessel. It turned out that the tuna vessel was um, illegally fishing sharks. And the bodies of three of these men were thrown over the side of the ship. It was a horrendous story. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we, we got this story um, from, originally a tip off came from a group called the Environmental Justice Foundation and um, they were operating in Jakarta, although they, they have offices in London, headquarters in London, and also advocates for public interest law in Korea. And that was where the original tip off came. Um, however, uh, as a, a journalist, I do a number of different, I've got a number of different hats on. Um, so I didn't really get to the story until the South Morning, South China Morning Post um, got there first, and they published an account of what happened um, when a, a video, basically a video of, of a Chinese crew members throwing the body of, of one of these fishermen into the sea, um, taken by the fishermen, and this went viral in Korea, and the story blew up, and the South China Morning Post was. Uh, published uh, an account of the story. However, um, these stories are, are rare. I, I wanted to tell the story. I wanted to, but I wanted to tell the, the story not in the same way that the South China Morning Post did. I wanted to tell a very human story. I wanted to talk to the survivors, their families, and, and get as close as possible to the human drama, kind of identify them and, and tell their story. I wanted to find out who the fishermen were, where they came from, were they friends, where did they come from, how did they die, what happened before they died, and just some of that detail which makes a story compelling. Um, and we found a local reporter, Fabriana Ferdows, who was based in Jakarta, and she spoke the local language, Bahasa, and we began looking for survivors and their families. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, were, we were able to talk to two of the survivors. There was actually a lot of difficulty because the survivors, many of the survivors had been, had gone back to Indonesia and they were being held by the Indonesian authorities. So we, we still don't really know why they weren't allowed to speak, but um, they were being held. We couldn't talk to them. But we ended up talking to two survivors who got off the ship earlier and we actually through them we we got a, an incredible story because they had been present when two of the men had died we were able to cover a lot of that ground we were able to find out an awful lot about what happened we were also able to get hold of two videos one was the viral video that um, was released in Korea of the body being thrown overboard on, on the ship. And the other one was a very shaky upside down film taken on a smartphone where there was a lot of ha happening and there was a lot of confusion and a lot of people. But through our interviews with one of the survivors, Utah, 
and the uh, he was our main interviewee, we were able to piece together exactly what was happening in this video. And um, more importantly, we were able to identify the men who died, the young men who died. So we, we kind of gave them a, a face. We saw them moving around in, on the ship. And I think it really brought home to people what was happening out at sea, what exactly was going on there. So it, it was a, we, we, we the, the video team at the Guardian produced a much shorter video and it was very powerful and told a, 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 a very good story. Fabriana also um, spoke to the families of the men at home. And from there, we were able to find out that two of the men that, that um, set off on this journey were best friends. They came from the same village um, and they set off hoping for adventure, hoping for a lot of money. They told their families they were going to earn a lot of money and they didn't return home. So it was a human tragedy. Could you start the video, please? Sound off, please. Thank you. Okay, so what we're seeing at the beginning of the video that the young men, this is the night before Eid, so the men are in very high spirits. They're smoking, they're laughing, they're giving the thumbs up, as you can see. They're larking around, they were working. This was before anyone became sick. Um, and, you know, the, it was very early on in the trip. We later found out that they were working 18 hour days, they were fed, distilled seawater, they were given very poor food, the conditions got bad, uh, the conditions were very bad. They were promised salaries, as it says in here, um, but their passports were confiscated, they couldn't get off the ship. But as we see in, in this initial video, we see sharks being caught here. Now, they were, it was a tuna boat, so the boat was supposed to be um, catching tuna, it was actually catching a lot of sharks. Um, and we'll see from this video, one of the Chinese crew crew member here, he cuts the fins off the shark. And while that is not illegal, what the video was able to show us is a little, a little later from the video, we see that this, the body of this shark is thrown overboard. And that is the illegal part. It is not illegal to cut the fins off sharks, but it is illegal to throw the bodies off boards because what that means is that they're not they're not keeping the sharks and the fins together so they're just basically using these um, sharks for their fins um, and a little while later this this is Sepri and he was the first man to die um, and then the video carries on and you see the other people this is Effendi he also sadly died um, Ari um, and Alfata. Um, and and as, as it carries on here, uh, we know that, as I said before, we know that these two of the crew set off together. A lot of the men knew each other, were friends with each other. This video, this part of the video here is the, the, the video that went viral um, and we were able to identify the man in the the man who's being thrown overboard here, and he is the man who set off from the small village with Sepri, who was the first guy to die. So we 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 see exactly what's happening all the way through the video. So um, the result here, I think, is we had a story of uh, from initially from a story of a very poor poor fisherman from Indonesia um, that set off to the story ended up being a very, a very compelling narrative of, of the young men together who set off. Um, and through the video, we managed to sort of piece together exactly what was happening. In the end, uh, this, this story got an, a, a very large number of views, 133,000 um, page views. And according to analysis, from the Guardian, it really engaged readers and readers read to the end of the piece and the piece was 1,500 words. So that's actually kind of quite a record in terms of people reading to the end of a story. Um, the, the video also got 18 
thousand views on YouTube and other platforms. And I think it's, an, it's a good example of, of, of where you can tell a story from a human perspective, get all the key details, um, interviews with, with um, the people concerned and provide a, a compelling story where people are interested and can read about what happens out at sea. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, staying with you, Karen, as you are our resident journalist on this panel, I was wondering, and we have a lot of journalists who have joined the chat, I was wondering if you could possibly kick off our Q&A session with a couple of questions for our panelists. I know that you had already had some um, questions in mind and it would be good to hear them first. You're on mute, Karen. Sorry, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Peter, there's a question for Peter. Peter, you, you talked about RFMOs um, being able to check the, check technology to find out um, if, if uh, vessels were breaching conditions. Is that actually something that they ever do or have done? And a second question is, um, would it be possible using the surveillance that you talked about to identify kind of the worst, the worst RFMOs, the people who are like not picking this sort of stuff up? And if so, <laughs> I'd like to do that. Um, is that something that is possible? Ooh, it's, it's a hard question to, uh, to answer and, you know, part of the, you know, part of the reason and, and Peter will probably be able to speak to this far better than I, that one of the challenges that you have is you have got multiple jurisdictions at mm -hmm. sea. And so under the auspices of uh, UNCLOS, RFMOs are managing migratory species, but in the same water column, you can have two or three different RFMOs. And one of the challenges is understanding what vessel is authorized, which, which vessels are licensed, and also what, what species they're uh, what species they're actually catching. And so, you know, for example, one of the big challenges, uh, you know, would be say something like the uh, CCSBT, which is the Southern Bluefin Tuna uh, RFMO, and this regional fisheries management uh, organization's waters go across all sorts of different, uh, all sorts of other regional fishery ma management organizations. And so identifying what species is actually caught is hard. The flag states of the vessels who are fishing in the waters of regional fishery management organizations are required to provide those RFMOs with the vessel monitoring system, the VMS data, of the, the vessels which are uh, operating in their waters. And that should then be checked. You should also then get uh, reports on um, observer reports for say transshipment. One of the hardest challenges that you have is assessing compliance because with remote mm. monitoring, you know, th there isn't much technology that can get us to, um, you know, make that assessment on compliance. And it goes back to what uh, Peter was talking about in the in the first brief about the, the things of privacy, the cameras on board, the degree of intrusion, the degree of monitoring of what is happening on board and the privacy concerns from various from various countries. And so RFMOs need to uh, need to do a little bit better. Um, and one of the reasons why we set up the Global Fishing Watch um, carrier vessel portal was to help show them that they can that they can do that, but they have uh, small secretariats and quite a quite a large remit, mm. uh, and so it, it's a it, it's a uh, it's a challenge. Linked to your, um, your your excellent uh, brief, though, I think that it was encouraging that you look at uh, one of them, say like the Western Central uh, Pacific uh, Arfmo on tuna, where they. Um, are actually putting in uh, management measures to try and protect workers, to try and uh, provide some cover for those uh, for those working on board the vessels. Okay, thank you. Um, I also had a question for Dia, uh, if you don't mind, Dia. Um, 
I, I was interested when you talked about Western Canada as a hotspot of illegal fishing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And secondly, it would be useful to know if how spyglass is actually being used, how you're using it. Sure, thank you so much. Um, yes, so I know it's a bit surprising when someone says that yeah. Western Canada is a hotspot. Yeah. Um, it changes kind of the narrative from like West Africa and East Africa to there. But um, the thing with Western Canada is that we have, I'm here, I, I live here. So we do have a strong monitoring system that is mm -hmm. meant almost, I would say, exclusively towards coastal fisheries. So it does right. not go as far as, you know, like, uh, for example, the typical US vessel patrolling going, like it's really mm -hmm. coastal fisheries. This means that they're gonna catch a lot of what we call the small day guys, um, you know, recreational fishermen, small scale mm -hmm. fishermen, uh, you know, smaller kind of offenses as opposed to like those big trawlers going to some areas of the world. Right. However, when you accumulate that, it still, you know, constitutes a, a large risk. So that's why I like the, the high monitoring of, on coastal fisheries will always mm -hmm. have, will always yield larger results in terms of numbers and enhance communitive impact than mm. you know, other places in the world with a lower rate of monitoring. Um, and then Spyglass. So Spyglass was really created out of frustration. So I created the database that is behind it out of frustration after seeing at numerous instances, uh, some governments dismissing other vessels that are not, that are, that fished illegally, but that were not necessarily uh, flagged, uh, no pun intended, on the IUU list. Um, and it's very, it, it creates a certain bias. So if a vessel, at many instances with governments I had engaged with, uh, when a vessel was not listed on the IUU list, they wouldn't do the due diligence of checking whether they had like done something wrong, because it was very difficult to do so. Like the flag states were not necessarily always cooperating and sharing the information, or sometimes they didn't absolutely know where that, what their vessels were up to. So it ended up with a vessel that might have been high risk, that might have had like forced labor on board, had fished illegally with, with impunity, you know, like all sorts mm. of things, not being listed. And mm. yet it was known somewhere in the world that had, it had done something excessively wrong, but mm -hmm. the information was not available or accessible. So I had mm. decided to just put a database together and then eventually was like, okay, since it exists, this database, let's just make it available to everyone. And that's where when Spyglass came to be. And governments... Um, NGOs as well, they use it for like uh, the US Coast Guard. They, I don't necessarily know how they use it, but they had requested access to it, like access to confidential information within it, because it's like uh, there is still some confidential information in it. Uh, some governments use it as a criminal record check. So just quickly checking whether a vessel has been reported somewhere as, uh, you know, having done something wrong. So we search for information in nine languages. So we add in an extra layer of accessibility. But um, the Canadian Coast Guard has also access, like confidential access to the information that is hidden behind the, the scenes. Um, but yeah, it's like really, I would say governments really use it for, um, uh, you know, the criminal records. So is this vessel high risk? Do we give it a license or not? Um, is, is very important for, especially like in East Africa, for the governments that use it in there. Okay. Great, thank you for that, Dia and Karen. Um, we'll move on to the Q&A session now. We've got about nine very good questions. I'm gonna start off with Mike Shanahan's question, um, which is what needs to happen to bridge the gap between number one, detecting ocean crime or suspected crime with advanced tech and B, actually catching the criminals? Um, is that a question you would like to answer, Peter Stoltz? Uh, I, I could I would preface any answer to that question with the uh, perhaps broader approach that we need to take here, which in my view is deterrence. So yes, catching the criminals is wonderful and it makes headlines and you know, uh, but ultimately the best form of crime um, prevention it takes place uh, in, in the minds of uh, a potential criminal when <laughs> he or she decides not to do it. and. And this is what I, I think AI probably has the most potential um, in terms of getting more and more um, vessels, which are part of surveillance systems, either through RFMOs, as, as Peter indicated, that's tough to do in many other cases. So can we link them? Can on calls be updated to, to actually fit the, 
the current century that we live in. Um, and, and that could be useful too. So I think deterrence is probably more important than anything. And one thing we didn't mention today is the fishing, uh, legitimate fishing operations need insurance. Um, this is another angle that's being looked at now by many analysts. How can you get the insurance industry to play a game here and, and refuse to insure vessels that have had citations? Um, if a vessel is not insured, it should not be out in the ocean, certainly not with workers on it. So um, yeah, but, but removing from there, I, I think it's the same thing with any other, there's a, the, some debate within the conservation community, is this a wildlife crime or not? Um, but I like looking at the, the um, perhaps uh, parallels between these two areas of criminality. And um, you, you, see, you see many of the same problems, which is that, yeah, you get a lot of effort can go into uh, investigations, in some cases, especially if they're popular in the media, investigations of certain families in Spain that have been infamous for fisheries crime. Some people know who I'm talking about. But but that being said, um, for the average, you know, everyday case, it's difficult to get the proper media coverage on that to generate enough attention or heat so that um, enforcement agents will spend the time. Because enforcement agents, let's not forget, you know, they're extremely overtaxed. And that's true in the wildlife sector. It's true in, in, in the illegal fisheries. So um, one of the, the questions, the answers that I would, I would give to this then is that, yes, Let's focus on deterrence moving forward. That's important. Now, of course, making examples of people and catching them is a great form of deterrence too. So it's, it's gotta be done, um, but the resources have to be found to, uh, to de dedicate to this. And using the technology, I, I think can help us. It's not going to be the only answer. Thank you, Peter. I think also one of the great myths about AI is that it's an elitist platform that, um, that a lot of developing countries won't have access to. And this question by Julio Batista, which asks, there is no doubt about the importance of these technologies, but how accessible are they for reality to the media and governments of less developed countries? I'm wondering if Peter Horn and, and Diego Labib could tackle this question, please. Certainly, uh, I'll, I would like me to start. Um, I, I think that they are increasingly uh, accessible and you see things like Global Fishing Watch uh, allow the, you know, allow the uh, broad access to the data. I think the European uh, Space Agency with their Sentinel data make um, synthetic aperture radar and electro-optical radar available. And I think that all the time, technologies like this become more and more affordable. And so the access to the, the information is uh, is good and getting and hopefully getting better. We've got to keep on pushing because a lot of you know catch documentation and all of this stuff to verify what's actually happening. The ownership data is not in an electronic databases, and so you've got this challenge with organized uh, structured and unstructured data, and so therefore it's it's quite difficult to do that. But I think that the technologies are becoming available. But I also think it's um, very, very important to recognize what the problem is, because I've been talking with uh, some developing countries who were wanting to use synthetic aperture radar for challenges with blue boats, very small fiberglass boats. A radar in the sky is not what's going to be the right uh, solution for them. And so what you need to do is use the right technology to address your problem rather than say, I've got this technology, now what can I use it for? Uh, and so I think that a lot of technology is becoming more accessible. There are capacity building um, initiatives in place in the, in the UN and the World Bank. And so hopefully that information should be accessible. It's just a case of using the right information. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for that. Um, I will add to Peter's point, there are two aspects to accessibility. The first one being affordability that has been addressed uh, by Peter, and it's a very important aspect and capacity as well. But there is another paradigm shift that needs to happen is that countries often struggle to engage with existing technology and initiatives because they do not feel ownership and agency over those technologies and ownership. Argentina is going to resist a bit with, you know, these 
emerging AI systems, for example. The same thing in Africa. We're going to have these struggles as long as the countries do not feel ownership and agency over these kind of technologies. And as they want to have their capacity built, as Peter has just mentioned, they want to be able to independently and say, this is applicable to us. You know, they want something that they can identify with. So it's not always the case with the uh, actual technology. So yes, it's a matter of affordability and Global Fishing Watch is affordable. It's basically free, but it does not respond um, always to the issue of we want something that gives us information right away so that we can send our poor small vessels out there right away and catch the culprit right away. You know, the other thing to know is that it's not necessarily always adapted to court systems. So in many countries of the world, AIS systems are not going to be used. You know, a judge is just going to dismiss the case and so it's say, no, this is not enough. You know, this is based on a machine learning system. This is based on algorithms. So it's not enough for me to say that this vessel has fished illegally. So there is really a paradigm shift that needs to happen so these countries can identify but also the systems can adapt to the countries and how they use them. Thank you, Dia and Peter. Our next question is quite general. It's from Deng Ngor, which is how easy is it to fight oceanic crime? And I was wondering if Peter, perhaps you, Peter Stewart, you could answer that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's very difficult uh, for all the reasons we've discussed today, I think. And you know, the, anytime you're dealing with the global commons, uh, you've got this question of ownership and, and you have uh, what, we, what we call collective action problems. Um, so it's, it's easy to cheat and get away with it. It's, it's, it's uh, perceived anyways as more difficult to comply. Um, that I think has shifted over time and then it's become quite, quite clear that it's in everyone's interest to uh, comply in the long term. But when you have um, things going on such as Northern states still plundering the resources of Southern states, it becomes difficult to convince everyone of that, right? Um, the uh, one thing we haven't talked about here are is um, uh, seafood uh, certification programs, which do exist. And, and uh, of course there are big debates about how effective they are in terms of changing human behavior. Um, but I think it's Ill illustrative of, of the difficulties we face that you know none of them have probably made the difference we'd like them to but some of them have been quite successful and if you go to seafood watch you know you can you can get a good sense of how sophisticated it's become now and ai could make a big impact there too in terms of getting you know um, seafood companies large companies anyways should certainly be complying if they want to factor into this so and i raise that question because it's really not just about um compliance authorities or enforcement it's it's also about consumers it's also about people that are buying fish. And again, we're focusing on fish, but there are many other things um, that, you know, uh, I mentioned sand mining. So, you know, when you're buying sand to make concrete with, um, cement with, are, are you in fact ensuring that that's coming from a legitimate source? And the list goes on and on. So it's about consumption as well. It's, it's not just about um, enforcement, but it's, it's very difficult. There's no question about it. I think it's one of the main tasks we face moving forward. And we haven't really talked about climate at all, climate change and enforcing <laughs> uh, various international conventions on that and the justice aspects there, but that significantly complicates it too. Thank you, Peter. So some of the panelists have discussed the role of transparency and the transparency of information. And it's at the core of a lot of journalistic work because if we can't have access to that information, then it's very, very difficult to produce a story. We've got a very interesting question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, it reads, a recent S S CSIRO paper and associated article in the conservation accusation shows of advocating for radical transparency and that the fishing industry is disproportionately targeted for such transparency interventions that undermine competitive advantage. Do the panelists have any sympathy to this position? anybody that would like to particularly answer this first? Um, can I answer I briefly? I, I didn't quite catch the beginning of that, but essentially, do you have sympathy with the fishing industry? Um, I, I think that, uh, well, and, and in the, on the basis of transparency, I mean, I think that the, a lot of the problem lies not, not, because of the fishing industry 
itself, but because there's no proper controls and there's no monitoring and there's no, you know, the monitoring and the controls are very weak. It's a very poorly regulated environment. And if you are a fisherman, uh, I think trying to make a living, um, I think it's, I think it would be quite difficult to go out there if you don't have those controls. I mean, we're all trying to, we're trying to do what we can with the, with, with the constrictions on us at the moment with coronavirus, we're all doing what we can. We're staying indoors, you know, but, but we are reacting to a number of rules that have been placed on us, even, you know, by our governments. They've, they've told us what to do and we realize that it's very important and we have had lots of, um, you know, we've had lots of uh, camp public information campaigns or whatever to tell us why this is important. We've seen dying people in hospitals. So it's in our heads all the time and we just think this is having an impact. But where is that, you know, where is that with, with governments? Where are the governments, like the EU has lots of rules and regulations on overfishing, but it doesn't, it doesn't adhere to those rules. Um, and that's the, you know, it doesn't adhere to its own rules. So I think one can have a certain amount of sympathy with people who are, who are, who are not adhere, you know, who don't have enough rules to adhere to, or who aren't seeing fines, or they, they aren't seeing the importance, um, kind of translated through their governments that would stop them doing what they're doing. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, and I think a lot of other panelists will want to answer this question as well. I think it's interesting because I think the fishing industry is one of the least transparent industries out there. So this whole notion that, there, that it's being particularly targeted as part of a radical transparency campaign is slightly contradictory. But, uh, but it's still a very interesting point and it seems to, you know, it's something that we have to be taking into consideration. So Peter Horn, I know that you had a few words. Uh, thank you. I think that it, this goes back to the internal and external transparency thing. And uh, to some degree, I have a, uh, a degree of sympathy um, because, uh, you know, uh, our position is that there is the need for this internal transparency that the, the fishing vessel, wherever it is, if it's outside of its uh, flag state's waters, should be transmitting its position and what it is doing. And that information needs to be shared simultaneously with the RFMO or the coastal state in whose waters that vessel is, uh, is offering it, uh, operating in. And that information flow needs to happen. There's nothing about uh, taking, you know, a, a sort of competitive advantage uh, away there. It's a, as much a safety thing as, a, um, a, a, as, as an authorization and compliance element. However, of course, there also needs to be a bit of external transparency where we in civil society need to be able to check that people are actually doing their jobs. Um, because what we see is that they're not perhaps as assiduous in those as we would like them to be. And so we need to force the force the pace to increase the to increase the transparency. But the first thing that we've got to do is get that information flowing between the right authorities for them to take action. And it isn't happening yet. And so because it isn't happening, that's why a lot of people are asking for much broader transparency, because if if, uh, if governments and authorities aren't stepping up to the plate, the people want to hold others to account. Thank you, Peter. Dia, did you have a few words you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yes. Um, so I wanted to talk to add a bit to what Karen and Peter have just said. It's um, there is really something that's quite important, which is when we're talking about criminals versus criminalization. So in terms of sympathy, I would say that I have, for example, sympathy to the people that are this, from the small scale sector that engage in drug trade in Latin America, etc., because they had been driven to that because of the different drivers that have been there. Yet they get their basically drug mules. I have sympathy to the crews of the that are arrested yet they have been trafficked into slave labor and they have sympathy for those that engage in illegal fishing because either they don't know any better or they have been forced to engage in that because of a lack of alternative livelihoods. That said, um, 
the, this, this narrative about criminalization and criminality, which like criminality basically says like you know, the opportunity makes a thief. And it's not always the case in the fishing sector. There are multiple drivers that drive illegal fishing. And that's the point where we can have some sympathy and address the drivers. But in terms of transparency, we are far from actually being transparent in the fishing sector. Noting that, for example, we have a list of 300 vessels that are blacklisted, and then we have 7,000 vessels on spyglass, yet those are only the tip of the iceberg. Catches, for example, are, I would say, 50% of the catches globally, or 40%, if my memory is correct, is actually unreported. So we still struggle with transparency, and we have to make a case. We have to show examples so we can actually increase that transparency to avoid criminality and hence not generate the criminalization of the poor as we tend to do sometimes. That's what I want to add. Thank you, dear. And still on this issue of transparency and access to data, as we all know, it's very difficult to get hold of information uh, linked to illegal fishing activities. And we have a question here from Joydeep Gupta, who is in India, which is, where can we get data about prosecution of illegal fishing in the Indian Ocean, including the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea. In addition to that, he asks, is it easier to check illegal fishing within the EEZ of a country? And are any of those figures available? Um, who would like to answer this from the panel? I know, Dia, that you've had some, you're quite used to working with data, so perhaps I'll send that over. Um, sure. So the first resource that I would um, I have to give the name of the resource. So the Indian Fusion Center has actually quite a lot of reports that are published every month, and they do have a very an amazing platform. The data on prosecution is not easily obtainable because when you catch a vessel, you have to wait till the, the usually you have to wait till the end to be able to have information on that. For example, just one example, if you remember the vessel that has uh, the captain that has ordered uh, his crew to shoot uh, people where they were in the water and you know then the phone, the cell phone was found in Fiji etc the captain has just been sentenced like last week you know like that's the actual you know end of the prosecution captain being sentenced to 26 years in jail so it takes time to get that information but eventually it's just a matter of um, of uh, of research. And in terms of, uh, so just looking at the, uh, where to check to find illegal fishing within the easy of a country, I will again brag by saying that um, Spyglass would be the number one resource because it's really comprehensive in terms of getting information. Uh, Spyglass.fish, that's the link. Um, there are other resources, again, like the Indian Fusion Center does amazing work, but we do share information. So at the end of the day, you're gonna find likely the, the same kind of information for only that area, but Spyglass goes beyond that region of the world. Um, and obviously, if you want to check, for example, for um, vessel fishing tracks, whenever you want to see whether a vessel has fished in an area where they're not supposed to fish, but they have not necessarily been caught, I would say that Global Fishing Watch would be a good resource because you can actually see uh, the vessel tracks and you can see, you can overlap those with areas that are, for, um, you know, prohibited and make your own conclusions. Can I add? Yeah. Um, yes, we do, yeah, we need we do do need better tracking of prosecution. Um, we need better tracking of um, the the end results of the criminal justice system when it comes to all forms of environmental crimes. You know, it just doesn't get the coverage. It doesn't get summarized in many cases. Um, it just you know it evaporates into this black hole that uh, we don't know what happens um, subsequent to the uh, the the splash of news and the arrest. So I absolutely agree with that. Um, international um, jurists need to, to take this more seriously. And, and of course there are scores of people devoted to this. And this is why the media is so important, you know, is to, to carry this through. And what is the end result of a prosecution? Um, not just what is the front page news. Thank you, Peter. So I'd like to invite now our panelists to all get off mute and answer this question with a simple yes or no at the same time, which is, will we still need, will we still need humans to fight illegal fishing in 10 years time? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we haven't gotten very far then with our AI. <laughs> um, with that, I'd like to close our panel. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and all of the participants. 
Um, and I would also like to add that the Earth Journalism Network has launched an Ocean Story grant, which is, I think the link is available in the, in the chat now. And um, all journalists who are attending this panel are invited to put forward their application, their excellent grants. They give um, opportunities to do some in-depth reporting on, on oceans. In addition to that, we've got a little survey um, included in the chat, if you care to fill that in. And thank you very much. It was a very interesting panel. And thank you very much for all of your time. And um, we'll all be in touch soon via email. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.